Well, this is the fourth one in our series of little books, which tries to make complicated things simple. And the little red book is the first one that we did when everyone was talking about red, and which is reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. And a lot of people thought, this is a great idea, but we don't really don't know how it works. So we did that. Well, there's another thing that uh, is really badly needed to solve this problem, and that's more finance. How do you get that finance to flow? Uh, can it come from governments? And how much of it could come from the private sector for biodiversity, to save biodiversity, to save forests? And the problem with that is that there are very different languages that people use on every part of this supply chain, from forest to the finance. So if you're a forest chief, you think very differently than if you're a boardroom chief in a big you know, ivory tower in London. So what we've tried to do with this book, the uh, little book of forest finance, is to try and put down that language in simple terms so that people can understand uh, what it means to get money to the forest and not to be fearful of it. Uh, in, in many countries I go to, if you talk to ranchers uh, or to people in the government, they say, oh, we don't want anything to do with these capitalists and all these carbon cowboys that come around, you know, they're going to rip us off. And some of them will try. And the problem is that if you understand a bit about the finance, then you can see who's a cowboy and then who's not. And you will begin to understand that when these big financiers come in, what their language is. And I hope that will do something to remove some of the mistrust and some of the fears so that we can all understand each other's world better. And that's really why we've published this book. And, and the figures in it are, um, well, they're, they're uh, eye-watering. I'm looking at page 25, and it, it seems to, to suggest that the annual amount that would be required to look after the forest is nearly 30 billion yeah. US dollars. Yeah which is phenomenal, annually, uh, with an initial outlay of um, 81 billion. Well, of course, this is an investment in the stocks uh, of biodiversity, which produce the flows of ecosystem services, which we all depend on. And those ecosystem services are massive. They're probably worth between ooh, anything up to four to five trillion dollars a year. And it's things like water, eight trillion tons of water vapor coming out of the Amazon every year into the atmosphere, falling as rain over huge areas and providing food and energy security, climate security because they're sucking carbon out of the atmosphere, helping to keep our atmosphere clean, storing it, and those kinds of things. Also health and human livelihoods, all of these things biodiversity produces for us. Problem is there's no market for them, there's no way of pricing them. So you might have a huge forest, but if no one's giving you any money for it, it doesn't show up on your balance sheet. And if you're a government trying to build new roads or hospitals or make prosperity uh, ports and harbors, if you cut down your forest and convert it to soy or palm oil or beef, I get real money. I get taxes off that. And I don't get any taxes off carbon in forest today. So you can see why all what's called the price signals, the price signals are for the investors and for the world markets are cut down forests and turn them into something else that I can sell. And that's a massive problem. It's a problem that is so big, we should just understand how big it is. You just mentioned 30 billion a year to try and halt deforestation. Sounds like a huge number. But what's causing deforestation? It's 80% of that problem is caused by agribusiness by the production of soy, beef, palm oil, paper and pulp, and biofuels. The value of that business is $92.2 trillion. So here in the Biodiversity Conference, we as conservationists are trying to say, you know, hold up our hands against a tsunami of money. We're not going to win against $92 trillion with even just a few 10 millions of projects or a billion. There's no chance. So we have to think very, very differently in the future. Old dogmas have got to be put aside. We have to find a way to get finance to flow to forests. And that's what the book is about, is looking at uh, how you can get finance to flow uh, in, in a more coherent way. And one of the key, I guess, tools people are talking about and are already in action are these market mechanisms, these price for carbon. But it, it seems, if you look at the clean development mechanism, for example, that you know, the carbon market is in serious trouble. So, you know, how, how does that relate to, to your book and how does that relate to your 
hopes for, for the Red Plus mechanism and, and other forest mechanisms? Well, it's true to say that Red Plus hasn't actually been given a chance to work yet. There are hardly any countries that have a national plan in place and being funded for Red Plus, and there are very few projects that uh, have actually <coughs> um, started to receive money for selling Red Plus credits. Uh, and the reason for that is not that just red is really complicated. It's because there is no demand for Red Plus credits. The money that's coming from governments is the donor countries say, well, we've paid it out, but the receiving countries have not received it. The ability to make that money flow is all getting held up in what are called uh, the intermediaries, like the World Bank and the IADB, the Inter-American Development Bank, or the Asia Development Bank, or the African Development Bank. It all gets held up along the way. So it can be given by donor governments, but it doesn't get down to the countries and to the projects which need it. And that's what's called the absorptive capacity of these countries is actually quite low, partly because capacity needs to be built. People uh, have not got an idea of how to run a red project. All of this takes time to learn. But there's another reason, and that is that the private sector has not been engaged at all, except in the voluntary market, which is very small but important. And why aren't they involved? Because there's no market. I say it's a bit like selling mangoes. You know, you've got a mango tree that's producing lots of mangoes, and they're all lying on the ground and rotting. Why? Because there's no market for the mangoes. Governments are coming along and saying, well, do you know what? These mangoes might be worth something in 10 years' time, because we're going to create a market here for mangoes. And then people say, well, that sounds really good, but..." When's it going to happen? Ooh, we're not sure, you know, maybe five years, maybe ten, probably not until after 2020. Well, are we going to leave all the mangoes rotting on the ground till 2020 and let the forest be cut down because there's no market for mangoes? That's the real dilemma we face today. So what we need to do is we need to create demand. What's been happening is everybody's been creating loads and loads of red projects and saying, this is how it can work. There's no demand. It's like building a huge apartment block, and we've been worrying about the light bulbs, the mix of the concrete, the size of the rooms, but no one said, who's going to buy the apartments? And people say, well, the government's going to buy them. Well, they're not. They might buy 20% of them if you're lucky. So you've got to go to the private sector to sell all these apartments. And we haven't figured out how to do that. So what we're going to do now, I think, is we need to create a new kind of demand mechanism for red, and we need to make a demand mechanism that twins it with producing sustainable food, conservation and sustainable food. If we can twin those two things, we will change the game. And final question, focusing on this mechanism, where, where what forum is this going to be sort of constructed in CBD where we are, or the UNFCC talks, the climate talks in, in Doha in, in a few months? Where, where can you see this being, being sort of constructed? Well, what's interesting, of course, is that um, this debate involves both conventions, and we tend to silo all these things. And don't forget the, uh, the third convention that's out there, which is the Convention on Desertification and Degraded Lands. This is also very, very important, because this is all about how we use land. And on the one side, you've got standing forests. On the other, you've got all this degraded land and agriculture expanding. We need to integrate these things. And that means pulling in climate. It means pulling in biodiversity and the use of land. Those three conventions all need to work together, and that's not easy to do. So the funding mechanism is going to be a cross-cutting mechanism across all of those conventions, but will be decided probably not by any of them. Because what needs to happen is the governments all need to get together, and what my particular idea that I think is the most important, not my idea, but what I think should be done, is to create an, what's called an AMC mechanism, an Advanced Market Commitment Mechanism. That means something at the scale of one to two billion dollars, which would create a guarantee for products which today have no market value. Those are things like uh, carbon in forests, the forest credit. No one can tell you what the price of that really is. And if you give a guarantee to the private sector or to project developers and say, we'll guarantee that the price of your mangoes, the price of your carbon, as it were, it's like a mango, I'm selling the mango, I'll promise you that for every tonne of carbon in your forest, I'll give you $3 a tonne. The government guarantees it. That encourages people to come in. But also, it can work for agricultural products which don't have a market today, like green beef, green soy, uh, green palm. 
these kinds of things are very hard to sell in the market. If the governments provide an incentive by guaranteeing a price for green uh, products of that kind, then the markets begin to work and you start to get these big international financing mechanisms start to really pull and create demand. They need to create demand. If we don't, then the wind is going to go out of the red sails.